He studied under physicist Stephen Hawking. He started Microsoft Research. Bill Gates calls him the smartest person he knows. He's written an award-winning cookbook that marries science with the kitchen. And his company, Intellectual Ventures, provokes vigorous debate in its unique business model that profits from patent portfolios. Some call Nathan Mirvold every kind of scientist, a Willy Wonka, a Renaissance mad. We add him to our exclusive list of the innovators. I'm Hanson Hossein. Welcome to Four Feeds. Nathan Mirvold, welcome. It's Thank great you. to see you again. We've had a number of conversations in the mm -hmm. past, and so what I thought we'd do is sort of look at what's happened over the last year. And what I've been most impressed by is that over, you've been very public in actually taking on some of the people who've called into question intellectual ventures the business model. You were at All Things D, and then the Slashdot conversation. Mm -hmm. Why did you feel it necessary for you to stand on the line of fire? Well, we really believe in what we do. Um, we think that what we do is not only a legitimate business, that it's really good for the industry and for the world. Um, uh, Jeff Bezos has an expression he uses about Amazon that they were willing to be a misunderstood company. And you can't really do anything significant in life if you're not willing to be misunderstood for some period of time. And that requires a lot of courage. Um, in our case, uh, quite a bit of courage. Uh, but this is our mission isn't just to invent things, though we do that, uh, or to uh, supply capital to inventors, although we do that. Our mission is part to tell the world that this is a great new model. That if the world invested more in inventors, we'd get more good inventions and our technological economy would do a lot better. How do you suffer through those slings and arrows, even though you know in your heart that you are right with this model? Well, it's, you have to try to focus on, on that second part, believing that you're right. Uh, and you have to uh, think that a lot of the people who are critical uh, are doing so because they misunderstand you. Now, there may be some that have an ax to grind. Uh, and so it's not a question of misunderstanding. It's a question of their own vested interest. But mostly, it's a question of, of misunderstanding. Uh, you know, I recently did this interview uh, on Slashdot that you were discussing. Now, Slashdot is a community of people that in some ways are my people. They're nerds, they're into technology, they're into programming. Somebody called you a nerd Tony Soprano, or did you call yourself a nerd Tony Soprano? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's... <laughs> Uh, I, I'm honored by the reference. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But certainly I agree with the nerd part. Okay. A and uh, we, uh, I think that if I could make the case well to, to these people or to more broadly to folks, I could get them to understand it the way I can. And maybe that's foolish, and maybe I shouldn't be spending time and energy trying to convince people, but I think it's part of our mission. I mean, even as I watch you, I actually thought that you actually end up turning a tide because you're... You, you, t you, you respond, you think with respect to what those questions are, and you actually, I think, you actually make a convincing argument, especially because over the last couple of years, we've seen p patent portfolios built up by Apple, Microsoft, GE. <laughs> Why don't they get that level of scrutiny that you do? Well, it's a good question. Um, it, you know, a lot of the way people think about a company like Apple is uh, not a rational list of, here's you know, a, a set of features that I check off. Uh, they love Apple products. Uh, they have affection for Apple as a brand. Uh, and so when Apple then goes and uses its patent portfolio and sues other companies, which I think is completely legitimate, by the way, for it to do, then it puts them in a quandary. Uh, but th the fact is when you have an idea, if other people steal your idea, that's not right. And the laws of this country and virtually every other country in the world say that's not right. So Apple has every right to say, if we do something really cool with the iPhone, we get to protect it. Uh, well, by the same token, we have every right to say, when we create inventions or we invest in inventions, if other people make billions of dollars off that, then yeah, every time you make billions, we ought to be able to ask for millions. So why do you think this is becoming such a, a valid business model now? Why has 
you beat it early, but now the other companies are piling on saying, yeah, we need to do this as well. What's going on with intellectual property and technology specifically that says this is the time? So uh, back when I first joined Microsoft, we had no patents at all. We had made two patent applications. And that was actually two more than almost anyone else in the industry. Uh, you had a very young industry that didn't have any patents. And when you don't have any, there doesn't seem to be that much interest in, in using them, because you couldn't. Uh, also, there was a tremendous amount of copying going on where people would say, oh, the, the, their competitor is doing X, now I'm going to do X. And if the competitor hadn't filed patents, that's actually legitimate. Uh, it, that created a bunch of companies that became what I call the winner that takes most. Not all. Not, no, typically not all. But if you looked around the PC business, didn't matter what element of it you looked at. If you looked at networking, Cisco was the winner that took most. If you looked at uh, microprocessors, it was Intel. If you looked at databases, it was Oracle. If you looked at operating systems, it was Microsoft, and so forth. So those winner-take-most companies became very comfortable with the idea of, hey, we won this whole big market. Isn't this great? Well, now as those companies mature, you've got a company like Microsoft or Apple that have been industry leaders for 30 years. Uh, they have deep patent portfolios. Uh, now other folks are trying to take those innovations away from them. And of course, it's perfectly legitimate for other companies to try to compete with them. But it isn't fair if they compete with, with them with their own ideas. Well, I think it's a, so. What's happened is that there's been a maturity. These companies have grown up essentially, and they recognize that they need to protect and to develop these things. And that's almost like when you're looking at research and development. It's called R and D. There's been a lot of R, but not a heck of a lot of D. And so we're making that distinction now as we move ahead. What's the difference between you and General Electric? It, briefly, because we're going to go to a break in a second. So, uh, well, General Electric of a uh, hundred years ago, there's not that much difference. You know, General Electric. Uh, one of the co-founders was Thomas Edison. And one of the first assets of GE were all of his patents on all, all kinds of electrical inventions. And you know what? I think we'll make up back from the break. I want to talk to you about the specific innovations that you're doing at Intellectual Ventures so we can get to the bottom of that and show that parallel. So we'll be right back with Nathan Beerholt. back with scientist and entrepreneur Nathan Mirvold. Nathan, we were just talking about the, whether there was a fundamental difference between General Electric and Intellectual Ventures, GE that produces things, Intellectual Ventures whose business model is to actually start essentially building a, a portfolio of assets around patents. Well, GE had its origins in the inventions of Thomas Edison. He was a co-founder of the company. He contributed patents which allowed General Electric to get going. And GE has been a tremendous success story, and today they make locomotives and power turbines and all kinds of business, medical equipment. Uh, but they, it's on the basis of their great ideas. Uh, and they have a patent portfolio, and I think they're not afraid of using that patent portfolio. Now, in a mature industry like locomotive engines that GE makes, uh, most mature industries actually understand the value of patents to one level or another. The tech industry, it hasn't been mature. It is maturing, but when I entered it, it was quite immature. And there was a strong open Probably. source libertarian philosophy underlying all of that as well in tech, as I imagine. Well, the early days of technology, uh, there were no patents uh, for most of these things. You probably couldn't even, actually, in that era, you couldn't patent software. More recently, uh, uh, the, uh, the rules have been changed so that you can patent software. And in that spirit of the early days of the industry, it was kind of anything goes. But it's not an anything goes, bunch of kids in the garage industry anymore. It's gigantic. Billions of dollars. And uh, kids in a garage now have the uh, hope for and have the prospect of, yeah, in five years we'll be another Facebook or we'll be something else that is enormous and multi-billion uh, dollar denominated. Well. It's important that the people that have great ideas get rewarded. And one of the things that Silicon Valley and the tech industry got right is the idea of a meritocracy, that people with great ideas uh, get promoted, that they can get stock options. Uh, you know, Microsoft created tons of millionaires that were never uh, 
managers. Well, s secretaries got it. Um, it, it. The success of the company was shared in this meritocratous way. More generally, Silicon Valley creates lots of companies that fail. But that isn't what matters. What matters is the ones that succeed. And so, it, you know, in the era that Google uh, started, there was at least a dozen search engine companies. They emerged as, as the best. The other dozen died. That's okay because Silicon Valley has this meritocracy notion that the most successful ones grow. Well, if you apply that meritocracy to invention, and you say, hey, we're going to pay inventors, and we're going to fund inventors. You know, part of what my company does is provide a source of funding to people who want to invent. Because most inventors don't necessarily have the ability to bring their ideas to market. Is that the problem? Well, or, or get funded in any way. Um, you know, once upon a time, there, there was no venture capital. Uh, and uh, you know, if you, the great Christmas movie, um, It's a Wonderful Life, uh, to start his business, George has to go to Old Man Potter. And it doesn't go That's well after you. that. That's not you, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. Um, what, since It's a Wonderful Life, this whole community of venture capital came up where there are thousands of venture capitalists, literally. Those people pump tens of billions of dollars a year into new companies, most of which fail, but the successes triumph. So, so what this, is not, this is democratizing innovation, not stifling innovation, is what Absolutely. you're saying. Absolutely. You know, we've uh, sent $400 million to individual inventors in the United States. Now, I, I don't think you meet anybody else who's given $400 million to individual inventors. Uh, and over time, uh, that number is going to grow. And I hope other people take up our business model and, so that like, just as venture capital provided absolutely necessary financing to get entrepreneurs going, invention capital can provide the capital necessary to get... Um, inventors going. Well, I think we, I want to speak to you specifically when we come back from the break about what you guys have done that actually has developed some of those ideas mm -hmm. and that people can actually see the fruition. Because I think some of the problem that people have with intellectual ventures is they don't actually see the product. And, and I, mm -hmm. you guys are doing some remarkable things. So when we come back with Nathan Mirvold, we'll talk specifically about what intellectual ventures is doing to bring invention to market. back with Nathan Mirvold, founder of Intellectual Ventures. Nathan, what's a, a good example of something you've actually brought to market, Some uh, a, an invention that you purchased, that you have the rights to, that you've actually developed into something? So one of the things you, that if you're an inventor, people always say, well, what's your great breakthrough? What, what are the products that I can see that you do? And the challenge is always that there's a long period of time between having an idea and seeing it work all the way out. Uh, so. Most of our inventions that are already in the market are things that we have licensed to companies like Microsoft uh, or Apple or others, and there's literally thousands of inventions that are of that nature. Uh, the exciting new ones that we invented ourselves and that we're bringing to market uh, include uh, TerraPower, which is a new kind of nuclear power plant. Um, now when we say that we're inventors, people think, oh, we're sitting around inventing new little gadgets or kitchen gadgets or things like this. We're looking for those consumer hits like an iPhone. And we're looking at some footage from your lab right now so you can sort of see some of the work that goes on in, at, in Intellectual Ventures. Yeah, so, uh, but we're working on a new kind of nuclear power reactor. Wow. And the reason we're doing that is the world needs a carbon-free source of energy. We need safer nuclear power. We need nuclear power that can actually take today's nuclear waste and burn that as fuel. And you've actually done research personally on climate change and what actually has to happen. Mm -hmm. And you've actually said it's got to be some radical changes. So I imagine this helps fuel some of that. No pun intended. Uh, well, <laughs> <or> pun literally. Intended. <laughs> <laughs> literally. Um, yeah, another uh, breakthrough invention that we've had is in an area called metamaterials. Metamaterials are a way to create artificial materials that interact with light or radio waves in ways that no normal material could. And our first product there is a, we've spun out into a company called Chimeta. And it's making a flat panel antenna that you can use to get bandwidth anywhere. Bandwidth in your car, bandwidth in airplanes, uh, boats, in any platform moving or not moving. All the places we want to be further distracted with the internet, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, yeah, I yeah. think so. Well, that's the bet we're making anyway. Okay. And uh, it, it uses a radically 
new, uh, new, this radical new approach of metamaterials, which is an uh, exciting branch of solid state physics. Uh, it's only a few years old. When it first came out, I read the papers, and it was very controversial. People didn't think that a lot of physicists thought it was wrong. We decided to bet on it, bet, and bet really big. And we have our first metamaterial company, the Chimera, and we're working on several other spin-outs on metamaterials. So I think our metamaterial uh, inventions are going to improve your li people's lives in a very direct consumer way once they say, yeah, that's how I get all that internet in my car, um, you know, in uh, planes, in boats, in ferries, in trains, any moving platform. There isn't a really good way to give uh, the moving platform um, uh, internet connectivity. You said bet, because I imagine there must be a, a great deal of risk in your business model. How would the level of risk, say, at Intellectual Ventures compare to a, a Fortune 100 company that's traditionally involved in R&D? So, each individual invention is very risky. It could be a total loss. Uh, and you just have to sign up to that if you're going to in the invention business. And there's also no way to tell. You might think, oh, well, let's just only work on the good ideas, not the bad ideas. But which idea is good or bad depends on lots of technological development that occurs over time. For example, how do I know someone doesn't come up with a better idea in two years or five years? Maybe they will. Um, in the case of this metamaterials invention, there were lots of physicists who thought, this doesn't work at all. It's a fundamental mistake. I read all the papers and I said, no, it isn't a mistake and we're going to bet on it. But I could have been wrong. and so. I think if you look at each individual invention, it's risky. We try to do lots of invention and try to do this at scale. And it's for the same reason that a mutual fund invests in multiple stocks or the reason an insurance company invests effectively in multiple insurance in, uh, mul um, uh, policies. It's in the statistics of large numbers that you get some predictability. So. We'll see in retrospect what our level of risk is. And I don't know whether it's more or less than your hypothetical Fortune 100 company, but we're hoping that we can both be wild out of the box innovators and yet have that be relatively predictable so our investors um, uh, don't have heart attacks. Well, uh, we're going to go to a break uh, in a second, but what I'd like to put to you to think about in the meantime is you, your legacy is assured. You, you've made your, your fortune. You've done very well. Why on earth would you want to continue producing? What motivates Nathan Mirvold after all this time and after all this success? So we'll ask you that when we come back from the break. Four Peaks is made possible by generous support from the Museum of History and Industry and from Weber Shandwick. We're back with Renaissance man and innovator Nathan Mirvold. Nathan, we're talking about risk, we're talking about criticism. Why subject yourself to all of this heartache and stress when you could just easily go diving for the rest of your life and play golf? Uh, well, I don't play golf. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> diving I do, yeah. I don't play golf. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, I like to do stuff I think is important. And some of the things that I think are important, uh, other people might think are frivolous. I, I do love scuba diving and traveling to, to far corners of the world. That's personal enjoyment. I, I can't say that that's important for the world. Uh, I like to cook, uh, and that's led to this whole modernist cuisine project. Uh, to me, cooking is really important. It may not be as important to others. Um, when it comes to my professional activities, I think it's important to stand up for inventors. And I think that if I take some of the arrows and stand up for inventors, uh, that is something I can really contribute, that if that results in more funding to more inventors in the future, uh, that'll be an incredible thing to accomplish. You mentioned modernist cuisine. Uh, I think when people first heard about it and said, oh, Nathan Mirvold, then they thought, oh, you know, is this a vanity project by somebody who had the time and perhaps money to fund it? But in the end, and we're looking at some video of what your kitchen looks like, it's actually proven to be quite profound in its impact, that you've actually brought this kind of science behind cooking to a large population. How do you feel about the contribution that you've made in that field? Well, you know, the, the, the idea behind modernist cuisine is that I always loved cooking since the time I was nine years old. I also always loved science. So here was an opportunity to try to do something that combined the two. And 
I had a very strong vision of what I wanted to accomplish, but I didn't have any idea as to whether anyone else would like it at all, to be completely honest. So uh, it could have been a vanity project. Um, it turns out that lots of people do like it, and it has had some impact, and I'm, I find that enormously gratifying. It's probably the most populous thing you've done. I mean, some of the science and research you do can be a little bit over people's heads, but people get cooking. So how would you feel if that? I worked uh, 20... on Windows at Microsoft. Oh, that's that true. had oh, yeah, a little we're... bit of impact oh, yeah, I heard for about a few that's, folks. I, I, but... I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how do you feel like if somebody comes, you know, 20 years from now, they say Nathan Mirvold really brought science back into the kitchen so we could understand it, and it's made a, it's revolutionized how we cook. How would you feel if that's how you remember it to a certain extent? Well, I'd, I'd be thrilled. Uh, it, you know, most people have passions, personal passions, like golf or scuba diving or all, all sorts of others. Um, and for most folks, and including for me in most of those things I do, uh, you're not really able to make much of a contribution. No matter how much you love that field, it, there's a limit to what you can do unless you dive in professionally. Well, here's the crazy situation where I, I love to cook, I love to eat, I eat in many great restaurants. Apart from signing the check at the end of the meal, I didn't really have anything to contribute to the restaurant uh, or to the, the, the larger world of cooking. Uh, modernist cuisine, I hope, can be that contribution. And it, it's hugely gratifying to you know, love an area like cooking and then actually be able to do something that, that might make a difference. Well, Nathan Mirvold, I usually ask this final question of all of our, our innovators, you know, what would you do if you were freed of all expectations and obligations? But I suspect you're already doing it. <laughs> So, yeah, it's not clear how different I would act. <laughs> okay. So, Nathan Mirvold, thank you very much for joining us on Four Peaks, and we invite you all to extend your reach by connecting with us at fourpeaks.org. I'm Hanson Jose. Production of Four Peaks would not be possible without the generous support of our sponsors.